Hi everyone, uh, this is Mike. This is my free YouTube channel. Please remember to subscribe and to like this channel. I've really been working hard at trying to grow it over the last couple of weeks, and I really appreciate everyone that's been tuning in on a regular basis, and, um, and especially for those of you that have been subscribing to follow this channel. I am offering discounts to my full member services that you can find on Substack and on Seeking Alpha. You can find links and descriptions to those uh, down below. So please remember to check those out and take advantage of the Super Bowl weekend specials I'm running for new members as an introductory offer. Also, uh, I ask everyone to, again, if you like these videos, please share them with your friends. Please help me grow this channel so I can continue to do more great videos like these. Remember, what I'm trying to do here is just try to bring to you the data and the information that are driving markets on a regular basis. Um, and trying to just help people uh, understand what's happening and what's uh, really behind a lot of the price action we're seeing so that you can make hopefully better informed uh, decisions on what best, see, what best uh, fits your financial needs. So uh, this week, obviously, we're going to have uh, the big CPI report. And this, I think, is going to be an interesting report just because uh, this is potentially going to be the first time we're going to see CPI actually fall below the 3% mark uh, in some time. So estimates, at least as of right now, are for a 0.2% increase for the month of January on the headline number versus 02 last month. Remember, we got those CPI revisions yesterday. Really not much changing there, but the December number did come down. That's most likely. That's mostly because you saw October and November revise higher, but in the end, it really didn't change things by very much. CPI X food and energy. There were no revisions, uh, so we're looking for a 0.3 percent increase uh, month over month, which is obviously uh, an annualized rate of about 3.6 percent. So that still has. Uh, some work to do, uh, clearly not yet at Fed target. Uh, uh, year over year, we're looking for this 2.9% number down from 3.4%. And then core CPI, we're looking for 3.7% versus last month's reading of 39 I noticed some interesting discrepancies on these median forecasts versus what the average numbers are so far. And I thought these were worth pointing out. Again, these number of estimates will probably continue to increase a little bit more as we go through the next couple of days. But right now, the median estimate for the month over month number is for 0 0.2. The average is actually a little bit lower than that at 0 0.16. When we look at the core, uh, again, the median is 0 0.3. The average is basically in line at 0 0.28. Where it gets interesting is in these year over year statistics. Year over year, we're looking for a median of 2.9, but the average is actually 2.94, which is just you know one hundredth of a percentage point away from rounding up to a 3.0. So that's how close these numbers really are when it comes to this month's year over year number. So I think that's important to point out. And then of course we have this average of 3.74. Uh, versus the median of 3.7. Again, just one hundredth of a point away from rounding up to a, a 3.8 uh, number. Uh, and so these are, again, just these minor things, but I think that they do matter and they are important and worth keeping an eye on, um, especially like when we're looking at things like where the uh, models are pricing in. What's interesting is that Bloomberg Economics is pricing in a number of uh, over, of 3%. Calshi, which is an online website, uh, is looking for a number of 3%. Uh, CPI swaps are pricing in 2.93%. And the Cleveland Fed is looking for 2.94%. So all of these models together, uh, coupled with the uh, the average are all telling us that the expectation is for a number to come in uh, above the median estimate of 2.9 percent. It's just a question of how it rounds now. Is it going to round up to a three, uh, or is it not going to round uh, enough and just come in at 2.9? Obviously, I don't I don't know. Um, but I think these are just little uh, intricacies that could end up playing out. I'm going to be updating these numbers, uh, of course, on Monday and subscribers of the services uh, as I get them and continue to monitor them. So if you want to continue to get a sense of this, please remember to check out those services. 
Um, also, what I find really interesting, I guess, uh, again, when we look at the um, ISM services for the month of January, it had a, a seven and a half percentage point increase um, in the month, 7.3 percentage in the month of uh, January. Um, that was actually the largest increases in services prices going back to August of 2012. And that eclipsed all the big gains that we saw in uh, much of 2021, uh, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So this was obviously a, a very big change. And you know the reason why ISM services matter quite a bit uh, is when we look at when we look at services prices, we know that this is obviously a big component to CPI overall. And when we look at these services prices overall, um, we can see that services prices have been a pretty decent indicator of future direction of uh, year over year changes in CPI. And at least as of this moment in time, it would suggest at some point down the road, we could see service prices, uh, we could see CPI uh, begin to increase again. Again, it, it doesn't tell us when, it could be this month, it could be next month, it could be March. I'm not really certain about that, but this is something that's sort of a, a red flag that we should really be aware of and keep tabs on because if we were to get a hotter services number again for the month of February, that would probably increase the odds of the uh, of the CPI number coming in hotter than expected at some point. Uh, the CPI number actually rising at some point from its current level. Uh, manufacturing prices, you, you're seeing something uh, somewhat similar um, where you saw that, where you actually also saw not only service prices rising, but manufacturing prices rising. And uh, what's interesting is that this obviously is happening at a time when you're not really seeing much happening in terms of oil prices changing. Um, in fact, oil prices really haven't done very much. This was obviously the summer months, but really oil prices have just been um, in a range, call it between 70 and, and 80 now for a couple of months and really have been more in the 70 to call it 90 range now going back for almost two full, almost 18 months now. So oil and energy prices really haven't really been, or they aren't really going to be much of a factor, at least uh, initially uh, in inflation in the near term. And what I think is driving some of these gains that we're seeing in, um, in inflation, in services, and in manufacturing is this big surge that we've seen in uh, shipping rates. And you can see since basically October, the um, WCI container freight benchmark rate uh, has risen by 182 percent, um, and this is one of the you know this is these rates right now are are some of the highest rates we've seen going back um, basically to this pandemic period, and they're significantly higher than what we experienced pre-pandemic, and this is obviously because of some of the tensions we're seeing. Uh, in the Middle East with uh, the Red Sea. And then of course, you know, we have these issues in the Panama Canal and the water levels, which are also likely contributing to it. And again, uh, CPI year over year, at least when we look at it, tends to have a relationship with these. Uh, here, when we just take a look, if we go back to 2010 again, you'll see that again, it's not very clear here, but when we zoom in on it and take a look, you'll see the, the relationship between these changes in these shipping rates and uh, NCPI over time. And of course, you can see it more recently, these shipping rates tend to lead uh, CPI by just a little bit. So we have, you know, the question really is at this point, is the reason why we're seeing, you know, these rising prices in the ISM uh, services and ISM manufacturing uh, a reflection of um, the uh, increased shipping costs and uh, the truth of the matter is, is we don't really know at this point if that's what it is. I mean, clearly it would look like it on the surface, um, but this is something that obviously we're just going to have to continue to watch. And I think really more importantly, it's a risk that I think um, that's out there. Uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why you're seeing, you know, break-even inflation expectations, one-year break-even inflation expectations beginning to rise again. You can see how all of this stuff sort of, 
overlays pretty nicely with one another when you look at it through um, the lens of history and time. Uh, again, like nothing is a perfect indicator, and it isn't to say that the one-year break-even inflation expectation is a predictor of what the inflation rate will be. But again, what it tells us and gives us is a general sense of direction. And the general sense of direction is that uh, it is rising with the services ISM, with the services, with the manufacturing prices paid, with um, the rise in container rates. And these are uh, something that's worth, uh, again, noting of course when you look at one year uh, zero coupon swaps these are also showing some signs of not rising yet but again i would expect that they will begin to rise because you can see that these typically trade with one year break even inflation expectations the other thing that is worth noting is when we look at the dtc data um, we see that um, um, if we go back just one month ago after the initial December CPI report, we can see that, uh, you know, essentially inflation expectations have been rising on DTC swaps, although they're not changing out here on the longer end of the curve. I find that inflation swaps are very good at pricing the next two to three months worth of inflation data. And then after that, they begin to become a little bit less precise. And obviously that's because data is changing on a daily and weekly basis. And so, the idea be the the um the idea being here is this is that it looks like if inflation is coming down in January and February it's sort of confirming what the data and some of the other metrics are telling us which is that it looks like inflation is expected to come back up in March and then of course where the data continues to go from here is likely to determine where April May and June go and um, clearly the expectation has been that these inflation rates are on the rise, right? And so this is something that, again, is, is going to have to be watched. And this is a reason why, um, you know, again, I think you're seeing 10-year yields, which rose yesterday. We've been talking about these in the daily videos. They're getting very close again to breaking out. Clearly, if the models are right and we get some sort of uh, CPI print that comes in at 3%, I think that's probably going to be enough to really get the 10-year rising. And even if this number comes in as expected at 2.9% and core comes in as expected, if we do see the CPI, if we do see 10-year rates rise, uh, regardless of the CPI print, I think it tells us a lot about what the market is really thinking about in terms of where inflation and the economy are really going uh, going forward. Um, and then, of course, when we look at the dollar index, that didn't break out and that didn't move much on Friday. But again, we're sort of watching this 104 and three quarter level. And just to finish up with the S&P, um, I had noted in the video on Friday uh, morning for you guys that I thought that the upside resistance was somewhere around this 5,000 and a quarter level. Um, I was basing that off of a couple of things. The one thing I was basing it off of was this upper Bollinger Band. I had noted that had risen to around you know 5,000 and a quarter to 5,040. Um, and then, of course, what we also talked about was that we had this um, we had this uh, upper end of the wedge that had formed, uh, and it looks like uh, it looks like again an ending diagonal or a rising wedge. Again, you can look up the definition of one yourself, but a rising wedge is typically characterized by starting with a broadening base and then uh, a narrowing at the top, and typically these patterns resolve by getting going back to the origin. Of their um, of the formation, which comes around 4850 or so, and at this point we're just going to leave it at that because I think if we start, you know, obviously breaking below other trend lines, then that becomes another whole set of complexities for the market. So that's not really something we we need to be worried about at this point. The other thing that was interesting on on Friday was that we had the VIX. Remember, we've talked about watching the VIX index very closely. That actually finished the day higher on uh, Friday as well. So this is also a, an important gauge because what this is telling us is that uh, we're going to have VIX OPEX on uh, Wednesday this week. You can see the big uh, put wall here is around 13 to 14. And this has really been why, you know, the, the VIX again can't get past this 14 area the last couple of days. But this will go away come Wednesday or so. And, you know, 
if it is the case that the VIX starts creeping up into OPEX, then uh, once we get past OPEX and these flows sort of diminish again, that could open the door for the VIX to start moving up, especially now that there's, um, uh, we're starting to see you know, the vol dispersion trade uh, fade away because you're seeing you know, the implied volatility levels of all the Magnificent Seven names really begin to come down. And despite um, NVIDIA continuing to uh, rally, what you're actually starting to see is, is the implied volatility level really settle out. Um, and this is typically an indication of, again, a stock that's, you know, that's sort of in a gamma squeeze where the gamma squeeze is starting to fade. And typically the things that I look for in a gamma squeeze, just to finish this off, uh, is when you get a condition where you have you know, the call implied volatility higher than the put implied volatility. Uh, in this case, what I'm using is the 105% moneyness versus the 95% moneyness. Uh, representing upside, representing downside. You can see 105 is priced above the 95, which is giving you a negative skew. You can see call volume actually was, I thought it was, it had been declining and it actually spiked on Friday. You can see put volume also spiked on Friday, but you can see the put to call ratio actually dropped, which is because you had, even though you had put volume up, call volume was up more. Uh, and again, this is sort of indicative of what's what we're seeing in a gamma squeeze, although you're beginning to see signs of that really beginning to fade. Um, and this is uh, going to be a major factor if indeed it is the fact that once you know NVIDIA gets past earnings, things begin to settle down, uh, that this trade will begin to unwind some and that will complete the, the cycle for implied volatility dispersion. Um, and again, I think it, it goes back to the, what we spoke about on Friday, which are these warning signs of increasing odds for a uh, a market correction coming but again 4850 right now is sort of that key level to watch in the s p uh, and with these inflation data coming this week i think really what the focus has to be is on rates because if rates start to move then um you know that that's really going to be a major factor i think on what happens next anyway that's all i have for you today i hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you next week bye